My name is Erin Murphy-Graham. My research focuses on gender, education, and international development. I'm particularly interested in the role that schools can play in empowering girls and women and in fostering more equitable gender norms. In this video, I discuss gender norms in education. And by education, I mean formal primary or secondary schooling. Education can also refer to courses outside of the classroom, like in after-school spaces or community-based organizations. Gender norms can have a powerful influence on young people's experiences of both gender equality and their education. Let's begin with two key concepts. Perhaps in the simplest definition, social norms are shared informal rules among a group of people about how they should behave. These can be spoken or unspoken. One example might be how we greet people, whether we use a handshake, two kisses on the cheeks, three kisses on the cheeks, perhaps a simple bow gesture. Gender norms are a specific kind of social norm. They are expectations and perceived rules for how individuals should behave based on their gender identity. So a common gender norm is that women should do the majority of housework. Importantly, social norms and gender norms can vary from society to society and even within societies. So we cannot assume that a norm in one society holds force in another. These concepts are significant because norms can promote or be an obstacle to achieving gender equality. There's still work to be done in advancing theory, and we have some excellent social norms theory resources on the Align platform. So what are some of the informal rules about what people think girls should or shouldn't do as it relates to their education? How might these norms limit girls' opportunities for education? And how might they limit boys' educational opportunities in different ways? Gender norms influence critical issues related to education, including who goes to school, who stays in school, and the quality of education that children and youth receive. How can inequitable gender norms affect experiences in school? A few examples can help illustrate. The practice of child marriage takes place all over the world and is shaped by a variety of factors, but among them, social norms that regulate girls' sexuality and gender roles. In Honduras, where I've conducted research on child marriage and schooling, when a girl enters into a union, the norm is that she stops studying. There's no formal policy in Honduran schools that dictates that married girls cannot enroll in school. Yet we found in a recent longitudinal study of adolescent girls that just 8% of girls who married stayed in school and the rest dropped out. So once a girl marries, the expectation is that she will prioritize her household. Research on child marriage and schooling also finds that when girls have dropped out of school, they're more likely to marry early. Once they're no longer studying, the social expectation is that they'll become housewives. It's the next step in life. So preventing the practice of child marriage and ensuring that girls stay in school, particularly through their second decade of life, are key sustainable development goals. Another consideration in the second decade of life for girls are the gender norms about pregnancy, which influence girls' chances of staying in school. Again, gender norms reinforce the idea that women are the primary or sole caretaker for babies. So even in places where formal policies say a pregnant girl can stay in school or a mother can return to school, girls are often shamed. And so they prefer to stay at home rather than go to school. ODI's research has found this in several settings of Sub-Saharan Africa. When boys and men become fathers, it's less likely to have a negative impact on their chances of staying in school. Similar to how gender norms reinforce women and girls' roles in the household, they also dictate girls' mobility, such as by influencing whether they can walk to school or whether they can be in school during the day. And conversely, boys are encouraged to play, to socialize, and to go out on the street. Gender norms also shape expectations of masculinities or how society tells men and boys to be a man. 
Masculinities can also hinder boys' education. For example, in Latin America, boys tend to complete fewer years of schooling than girls. And this is linked to the gender norm that men should be the breadwinner for the family. When this is the case, boys leave school. Another gender norm related to masculinity is that boys are not man enough if they do well in school. That school is a girl's domain. And so gradually, boys become disengaged with school to comply with the social expectation, which can lead to low performance and to dropout. These are gender norms that we hope will shift over time to promote quality education for all. But then this begs the question, what is quality education? In my work, I found that quality education can be empowering education. So empowering education enables youth to develop the critical thinking skills to understand, to question, and to reflect upon gender norms. They may come to understand some as beneficial, but see how others can be inequitable or harmful. School is an important socializing space that it can encourage debate, and critical questioning about harmful gender norms. From research, we know that attending secondary school is a strong predictor of more egalitarian attitudes and behaviors. But with greater attention to gender norms in school, these changes are even more likely to occur. One program led by the NGO Promundo is called Program H&M, which stands for man or woman. The program promotes youth critical reflection on gender norms and, for example, how rigid norms of what it means to be a man can foster homophobia, bullying, and school-related gender-based violence. In more than 25 adaptations worldwide, Program H&M and a video about diversity which is called Program D have been implemented in school settings and have also been adapted for a teacher training portal so that teachers can have the tools to deliver content that transforms gender norms. Teachers are a key group to work with, as research has shown that they can reinforce harmful gender norms. For example, by calling on boys more often than girls, or expecting boys to do better than girls in certain subjects, such as science or math. Promising strategies to introduce gender-responsive pedagogy have been developed by FAWE, the Forum for African Women Educationalists, which has more than 33 chapters across the African continent. This training allows teachers to examine their gender biases and to implement a gender responsive academic environment. In my research, I've examined the formal school program Sistema de Aprendizaje Tutorial, or the Tutorial Learning System in Honduras. SAT is a formal secondary school program and offers both lower and upper secondary education. One of the key concepts in the curriculum is gender equality, and recently supplementary materials have been introduced to explicitly challenge the gender norms surrounding child marriage, again working with teachers as key agents of gender norm change. One of the things we're learning from our research in Honduras is the importance of explicit discussions regarding gender and power. In fact, a review of comprehensive sexuality education programs, many of which were carried out in schools, found that programs that explicitly address gender norms and power were five times as likely to be as effective as those that did not. The Population Council is doing important work in a number of countries to make sure conversations about gender and power are happening in schools, and they are also trying to reach girls that have already dropped out of school through girls' clubs. Initiatives to promote gender norm change have sometimes been met with resistance. Working on norm change in schools also means working with teachers, with parents, and community or religious leaders so that they can address their own views about gender equality, and these efforts can be culturally responsive so that hopefully these stakeholders will become promoters rather than dismissive of these school-based efforts for change. Gender norms are part of a social ecology, meaning that they can be understood through an ecological, multi-level approach. So when we think about the educational experience of girls and boys, we do so by considering their individual experience within their families, their schools, their communities, and the cultural and political context at the local, state, or regional and national levels. Efforts need to work across these levels to ensure that change in gender norms can take place. 
Schools may be the single largest scale way to reach people, and they have enormous potential to contribute to change in gender norms. At the same time, they can also reinforce inequitable gender norms. So continued efforts to promote large scale, high quality, empowering education are vital. Thanks for viewing this video. I encourage you to have a look at our detailed resources on the Align platform to inform and expand our work in this field. Thank you. Thank you.